My name is Terrence Barkin and I'm the Executive Director of the Graphene Council, the largest community in the world for graphene producers, researchers, application developers, and end users. We have hosted the Graphene in Healthcare and Medical Applications conference series, and the video you are about to watch is from that series. So today I'll be talking about biosafety and biodegradability of graphene family materials. So here I'm not uh, telling anything uh, about the efficiency of graphene and different properties of graphene. But however, we see that really, uh, since there are a lot of applications of graphene materials in the healthcare products and also environmental products uh, applications, we it's really I mean important to study the fundamentals of degradation of graphene family materials and. So just to have an idea where I am located now, currently I'm in India. Uh, I just came from Ireland uh, a, a year ago and currently I'm working as a student professor at Isara Thiruvananthapuram. It is in the southern part of India. And <clears throat> so today most of my talk will be dealing about uh, uh, how these graphene materials are degraded by biological enzymes or uh, some kind of uh, plant enzymes also, not only human enzymes. So at the first, we, we found out that graphene oxide, which is a oxidized form of graphene. I mean, hopefully this kind of, I mean, the audience know about this. So initially we found out that some kind of uh, human engine, they can degrade uh, this uh, uh, graphene oxide solutions when they disperse in aqueous media. So this is a uh, enzyme called peroxidase, myeloxidase, which is extracted from the blood. I, I will go into the details a little bit about in the later slides. And later stage, we also found out that we can actually degrade also uh, graphene. It's not graphene oxide, not reducing graphene oxide. Uh, reducing graphene oxide. It's a crystalline graphene can also be uh, degraded by a similar kind of enzyme, myeloperoxidide, which is also from the uh, from the blood or from the white blood cells. So this is an interesting thing that initially we thought the graphene is a crystalline graphene cannot be degraded. However, it was also partially degraded. That we see really how it happened. And these are the various uh, 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 research magazines. Uh, they covered uh, some of our works, uh, especially the, uh, about the degradation of 2D materials, including molybdenum disulfide and hexagonal boronitride. Uh, uh, let's do, I mean, I would like to thank Graphene Council. They actually covered one of my work uh, in their uh, news article. And uh, the most of my watch, what I'm showing here, it is actually, uh, it was done, uh, in the laboratory of Professor Alberto Bianco at CNRS laboratory in the University of Strasbourg. Yeah, hello. And uh, so, so here we have a uh, sorry. Uh, so here we uh, we have an agenda to see what is the biosafety or biodegradability of graphene family materials. So. We thought uh, uh, to check not only graphene materials, but we also plan to do also other kind of uh, uh, 2D family materials, including hexagonal boron nitride and molybdenum disulfide. Uh, so we are, why we need to see the really why we need to see uh, the degradability of graphene oxide materials or graphene materials, since these materials are highly used or at least potentially studied for various applications, including drug delivery, gene delivery, and also various biosensing, imaging, and also for water treatments, including tissue engineering. These are some of the important applications I listed out, but there are various kinds of applications also. Uh, some of the applications just uh, previous speakers also mentioned for various sensing applications. However, there are also some of the healthcare products, like for example, implants. Uh, uh, there is a uh, spin out in a spa from Graphene flagship, uh, they are working on this uh, uh, some kind of, uh, implants for uh, brain disorders, and also there are some of the examples I took it from the literature. They have also implant for the nervous systems. If there is any uh, damage for the nervous system, so we can you know, have a kind of implant in the brain to uh, to know the what's going on in the brain uh, or in, in uh, the brain of mice, or it can be transferred to the humans. So there are some implants that, that, that can be also used for the cardiovascular implants. So, however, there are also some of the 2D material products, which are also, again, I took it from uh, some of the literature. So I think some of them are already in the active r and stage or in the uh, near to the uh, market stage. So especially, I think Samsung, I think 
think uh, they uh, opened up this uh, uh, flexible uh, device uh, or mobile device i think it is in the market i think they use graphene if i if i remember well and it is also actually uh, pursued for the uh, composites especially boron nitrate composite also graphene also uh, highly used so some of the solar cells they also flexible solar cells uh, uh, are, are also used this uh, graphene materials or also other 2d materials and uh, uh, graphene materials are highly used, uh, at least uh, I think some of the UK, they are trying the, uh, the, uh, very hard to bring it to the market. They are using as a uh, membranes uh, uh, to uh, for water treatment. <clears throat> and uh, so all these things, like whether uh, someone is working in a company with the graphene materials or uh, occupationally, unoccupationally, means like accidentally someone disposed them into, in, in, into, the, into the environment or into the soil or water, then again, it can be exposed to the to, to, to the humans or it can be inhaled by a person uh, like what i said like when they are uh, disposed from the environment or from the when they are working in the in, I mean, in the in, in the company or they can we can take it as a uh, implant or biodegradable products drug carrier systems all these ways are actually leading uh, leading to expose these materials to humans or animals or uh, also to the aquatic system since uh, at the end of the day from the from the company or from industries uh, it can be uh, it can be, uh, you know, it can be decomposed. I mean, it can be uh, like uh, disposed in the environment, and it can also lead to aquatic systems or uh, uh, the species in the in, in the sea or in the in, in the lakes. So this is very important to see how, how these materials are exposed. I mean, this exposure is very, uh, I mean, it seems to be inevitable. But really, what's happening when they exposed to the, uh, I mean, when they exposed these two D materials into the into the humans or animals or aquatic species just mentioned, what's happening? That is very important to study uh, whether we really want to bring this two uh, D materials or graphene materials into the market. So that's there we uh, we get this uh, nanotoxicology. So looking at the biocompatibility of these 2D materials or graphene materials and biodistribution, where it is actually uh, you know, uh, traveling in the body, where it is getting agglomerate in the body or in the kidneys or spleen or in the, some other parts, uh, and how the immune cells, like we have a lot of immune cells, how these immune cells are responding to this uh, you know, uh, alien materials. They are not known uh, earlier uh, to, their, to our immune system. And what is, a, so there it comes, whether these materials are cleared from the body or is there any, I mean, or uh, uh, whether they are degraded and they are forming any degradation products. That's also important to study. So it's, uh, I mean, having these two materials are really, I mean, it's, it's very nice. They are very promising. However, we, also, we, need, we need to also, uh, I mean, uh, assess what's happening also to these materials uh, when they are exposed to the uh, humans or animals. So to, with these aspects, we came up with some kind of a objectives, a special two objectives to check. Well, 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 the first one is the checking of the biodegradability of 2D materials, including graphene, graphene oxide, what we started by various peroxidase enzymes. And also checking that what is the chemical functionalization effect on the degradation of 2D materials. So these are the two things that we have a, uh, uh, we, we had as a objectives. And then why we need to study only with the peroxidase enzymes, not with any other enzymes. Since, uh, Human body has a lot of enzymes, not just uh, one peroxide enzymes, uh, not just oxidative enzymes, but we have also hundreds of enzymes. So, so they do different jobs in our, but, but however, this uh, This two, uh, these peroxide enzymes, they have uh, uh, like you know uh, when they they will be activated in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, and they will get uh, this uh, kind of a uh, active radical species, compound one and compound two, and these are important uh, you know oxidative oxidants or oxidizing agents. They can actually oxidize the you know uh, the foreign body materials. Actually, this they they, they have a I mean active role in the antimicrobial activity. So with that actually. So we, we, we thought to do this degradation uh, or biodegradation of these uh, graphene materials using this kind of peroxide engines, whether uh, this kind of a active or uh, reactive intermediate species can uh, re really oxidize also graphene oxide materials or uh, 2D materials uh, to degrade them in the body. So that's the reason that, so th th there are various uh, immune cells in, the, in, in, our, in our immune system like neutrophils, eosinophils macrophages, they actually contain the, some granulocytes. You can see the spherical, uh, spherical particles. So they have this uh, myeloperoxidase. And uh, when there is inflammation or they, when there is a uh, foreign body metal interaction, these immune cells get activated and they release these granulocytes and they release this myeloperoxidase. And that could actually, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, in uh, oxidize these materials. That's a challenge to our, uh, that's a task to see. And we see this degradation in the, in the three stages. The first one is the test tube model degradation. So where we see, uh, where we disperse the studio materials in the aqueous media or buffer media, and we add this recombinant uh, myeloperoxidase. So we isolate these uh, peroxide enzymes from the immune cells, and we add to the systems, and we can see that the nicely complexing. And then we add H2O2. I said H2O2 is important to activate these uh, enzymes to release this uh, active, uh, active species or radical species. And then that's how we understand based on the time uh, kinetics, we understand, for example, graphene oxide, it has a brownish color. It, it was a lot of after 24 hours. So that indicates something happened or oxidation of uh, graphene oxide happened. And then we also study degradation in the in vitro cells. So where we isolate these uh, blood cells or, uh, or uh, 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 neutrophils from the blood and we incubate with the graphene or uh, graphene vitreous and we see what's happening after uh, after a few days. And then we also saw the degradation of uh, our degradation byproducts. What are the degradation byproducts from these graphene materials or 2D materials? And what is the cytotoxicity of those 2D, uh, or those byproducts of those 2D materials? So this is how we did in the three stages. And uh, so we did actually a lot of uh, you know uh, studies in in, uh, in in actually in four years. So I just summarize uh, some of the works and I also go, go through some details in the few slides. So initially we studied the dispersibility, aqueous dispersibility dependent degradation of graphene oxide. So we varied here that uh, graphene oxide dispersibility and we checked what's happening to the degradation of this uh, graphene oxide. And the second case we studied the functionalization and we have some kind of bioactive molecules on the surface of graphene oxide. What's really happening? Uh, to these uh, materials, whether they can actually you know, activate or they can improve the degradation of these graphene materials. And we also check the pristine graphene materials. I said like pristine graphene material, uh, they don't have any oxygen groups and it's, uh, they are highly chemically resistant compared to uh, graphene oxide materials. So we also check that whether the pristine graphene can be degraded by similar enzyme peroxide enzymes. And we also check the boronated sheets. I mean, we know hexagonal boronated sheets also act, I mean, one of the important 2D material and they are not a, uh, a connector like uh, say a graphene. So, but still they have a very chemically resistant uh, resistance. So we also check that degradability of boronated sheets. And uh, one more important 2D material, molybdenum disulfide with and without chemical functionals to be, we interrogated what happening to these 2D materials. So, First, first case, we studied the dispersible dependent degradation of uh, graphene oxide by myeloperoxidase. Just to, uh, just to recall, this myeloperoxidase is from the blood cells uh, the, we, uh, or immune cells. We call, it, we call them as neutrophils. And neutrophils, we isolated this myeloperoxidase enzyme. So it's like a protein. So we, uh, we have this uh, uh, enzyme and we incubate with the... So here, actually, we have uh, two, three kinds of uh, graphene oxide. And they have a very good uh, in the dispersibility. I mean, they, they, in their dispersibility in the aqueous media. So you can see graphene oxide one actually is from the humorous method, the famous method. And we have graphene oxide two and three, which was actually uh, the both were obtained from two different companies in Spain as a part of the collaboration. So uh, Grupo Antolino and uh, Nano Innova, both from Spain. So they uh, they shared this material uh, with us uh, to check the degradability of the study materials. So in the case of graphene X2, we have a, a, a aqueous dispersibility, the stability maximum 24 hours. Later on, it got uh, you know uh, settled down at the bottom of the while. Uh, so, and if you look at the graphene X3, we from uh, Nano Innova, actually it has a poor dispersibility within five minutes. We saw the maximum uh, ma maximum of uh, uh, graphene X8 sheets were aggregated at the bottom of the while. So, when we add this myeloperoxidase, we can see in the, in the case of graphene X1 and 2, they are nicely complex with the uh, graphene X8 materials. Since this protein is a kind of cationic protein at uh, at the particular pH physiological uh, buffer, so that nicely complex with the negatively charged the graphene oxide surface, uh, and it forms this kind of complex ultrastatic complex. And in the case of graphene oxide C, we don't see since that's actually got aggregated at the bottom. And we added H2O2, and we saw the timeline at 20, uh, 15 hours and uh, 24 hours. What's happening uh, to the structure or to the oxidation of graphene oxide materials? And we found out that these materials were near, uh, I mean, they got actually degraded uh, since the, the D and G bands were completely lost. So that indicates the degradation of this uh, graphene oxide. And in the case of three, there was no degradation since the D and G bands are still intact. You can see the blue color, uh, uh, the, um, the, the bands, uh, the plot, D and G bands are still intact. So that means that because of the aggregation, they forming, uh, they are forming, I mean, very thick sheets, and it's not able to degrade these 2D materials or graphene materials by this myeloperoxidase. 
So we nicely uh, uh, visualize this under uh, uh, transmissional trauma microscope, where we have this, uh, we can see in the graph, one and two after 24 hours, uh, there were uh, no sheets left. Uh, however, there were uh, some fragments of graphene oxide and uh, most of the graphene oxide was actually degraded. So we do, that's the reason that we saw colorless uh, vials after 24 hours, 24 hours of treatment. And in the case of graphene oxide, as I said before, they got aggregated, we can see the thick uh, sheets after 24 hours. That's the reason that we don't see uh, much of this degradation or oxidation of these materials. So, so it, is, uh, it is clear that the dispersibility in aqueous media is playing a role uh, that oh, all materials are graphene oxide, but uh, their dispersibility in aqueous media, so our colloidal stability is playing a role to degrade them by these myeloperoxide engines. So in the next case, we saw the degradation of graphene oxide uh, by my, uh, or by horse radius peroxide engine. This is actually extracted from a plant called horse radius from the root. So it has this uh, peroxide engine, and uh, this is a, a highly used uh, as a model peroxide engine. Uh, this horse radius peroxide engine in biosensing and in in, uh, in calorimetric tests they use this horse radius peroxide engine. So this is a less potent compared to myeloperoxide, which is from our human enzymes. And uh, here we have a kind of fun chemical functionalization on graphene excess surfaces and some bioactive molecules are, are, are anchored on the graphene excess surface. And the, our role is to see whether these bioactive molecules are really improving the chemical, uh, in improving the degradability uh, kinetics of this uh, graphene oxide. So, so with that in the mind, so we had the two kinds of bioactive molecules. So one is uh, coumarin and catecholamoides, which are uh, attached covalently to the surface of graphene oxide. And again, this horse that is peroxide engine that was uh, uh, incubated along with the graphene oxide in uh, three different vials with the three graphene oxide alone and with the two different uh, functionalized graphene oxide materials. And uh, we saw the degradation. Now, I said that this is a, has a less potential, uh, you know, reduced potentials compared to myeloperoxidase. So it takes nearly 20 days uh, in the case of graphene oxide. Uh, uh, coumarin and catechol uh, functionalized one. And in the case of graphene oxide 3, it took almost 30 days to get a significant amount of degradation. So that's uh, indicating again here that the bioactive molecules which are attached down to the graphene oxide, they are really uh, uh, improving the catal uh, catalytic activity of this enzyme. Uh, so that, that means they are helping to, uh, you know, uh, electron transfer a uh, much faster way compared to graphene oxide alone. So that's the reason that we saw a uh, better degradation of this graphene oxide material. And in the thought, and in the thought case, we saw whether the pristine graphene materials uh, uh, can be degraded by these peroxide engines. So again, this, these are from the uh, neutrophils, or from the uh, human neutrophils. So this actually, in general, to just to recall, graphene oxide, which has the oxygen groups, like uh, carboxylic acid groups or uh, hydroxyl groups, uh, F-axial groups, because of that, we see the nice dispersibility of graphene oxide in aqueous media. However, we come to uh, graphene with uh, graphene. In general, pure graphene is highly water, uh, highly water resistant, means high, highly hydrophobic. In general, it won't uh, disperse in, a, uh, in the in the aqueous media. However, we have a uh, collaborators from uh, from France, from Bordeaux. Uh, uh, they 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 produce this uh, kind of a moderately stable, aquously stable uh, graphene oxide without any surfactant. In general, we coat with uh, different surfactants or polymers to disperse graphene, the graphene materials, pristine graphene materials in water. However, they developed a surfactant-free single layer graphene uh, in water that is stable uh, at, a, at a moderately uh, concentration for, uh, for two to three months. So you can see they use it. Uh, I mean, if you want to, uh, to, uh, to see the details, you can go through this paper, nice chemistry paper, which is a nice paper. It's a simple ma manner. They produce this kind of a moderately stable, uh, aquasly, uh, aquas dispersible uh, graphene materials. So we, we took this material uh, and we checked this degradation of graphene, uh, graphene materials. And here, actually, we have also a few layer graphene. That was fuel graphene was obtained from one more collaborator from Spain. They used a ball milling, uh, uh, ball milling method uh, in presence of a melamine. So, and they reduced, I mean, they removed all the melamine at the end of the process until they uh, they could able to get this fuel air graphene. And in the both cases, we saw the degradation was completed. Uh, I mean, not completed, but partially happened up to 40 hours. Instead of graphene, we saw in, in, in the place of graphene oxide, we saw the degradation happened in 24 hours, but here it took almost 40 hours, but still it is not, degra uh, not degraded completely. So, and we also did the degradation with, uh, with isolated neutrophils. Uh, so it means in the in, in neutral studies, here also we saw the degradation was happened in five days treatment. 
and that is also uh, again observed from the confocal Raman microscope. And uh, we also check the degradation of molybdenum disulfide sheets along with the Professor Manish Shawala from University of uh, Cambridge. Currently, he is in University of Cambridge. He was in uh, USA uh, earlier. And uh, here we have a chemically functionalized molybdenum disulfide and functionalized molybdenum uh, I mean, pristine molybdenum disulfide. In both cases, we saw the degradation of these two materials. Uh, however, H2O2 treatment was much better compared to myloperoxidase in the both cases. Uh, and one thing, the functionalized molybdenum disulfide uh, found to be highly uh, stable compared to molybdenum disulfide sheets, since uh, it is actually uh, uh, suppressing the uh, you know the rapid uh, rapid oxidation of molybdenum disulfide by colon functionalization of these uh, sulfur atoms in the molybdenum disulfide. Uh, yeah. And uh, we also found the degradation of this MOS2 in the in the, in the sheets. Uh, I mean, also in the cell in the in the cellular systems, not only in the in the in the test tube, but also in the cellular systems. And uh, I mean, with this, I would like to conclude. I think I'm running out of time. I don't know uh, since it's only ten minutes left hardly. So what we or what is my uh, you know conclusion here is that that we found out the degradation of the various 2D materials, including hexagonal boron nitrate, graphene, graphene oxide, molybdenum disulfide. Molybdenum disulfide seems to be highly degradable compared to graphene oxide, and uh, graphene seems to be a uh, no, uh, little bit uh, highly degradable compared to hexagonal boron nitrate. So, I mean, if you want to really plan any kind of biomedical uh, you know, implants or uh, healthcare products, we need to really uh, you know understand the degradation of these 2D materials. What is happening? The what is happening to their fate when they are when they are in the body and their their, their kinetics the, 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 the degradation kinetics are really important to, to really plan uh, you know a successful uh, you know clinical implant so uh, here i am open for any collaborations for checking the degradation of any 2d materials and also for developing a degradable materials especially i am working on bioelectronic part using a black phosphorus materials uh, since it's a semiconductor and it's also degradable material and uh, with this, I would like to conclude this and would like to acknowledge all the supervisors, especially uh, uh, Mr. Barkan for the, giving this opportunity to, to explain uh, and to present my work in a, uh, with this uh, large kind of audience. And I really thank you for all your uh, for our attention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rajendra. That, that was very interesting. This is uh, an important, really, really important topic and a, and a topic of high discussion because especially from uh, the further away you go from people who work with graphene in production or research uh, capacities and you get more to end consumers, um, there's high sensitivity to, you know, whether or not graphene is toxic, how long it lasts in the systems. Also, um, we've done work with regulatory authorities like the EPA and Tosca registration and the regulators are incredibly sensitive to what happens to graphene materials downstream, right? So um, we're working with NIOSH in the US on a workplace exposure study. So that's where graphene is produced. And then you have the next layer where graphene goes directly to a consumer, uh, which is usually B to B. So it goes to a business who then incorporates it in another material and where the regulators are very concerned is what happens when graphene goes further down the food chain, if you will, and into the environment and especially water sources. So your work is, is really, really important. And I think it's um, helpful that you did not only graphene oxide, but graph graphene, non-oxidized graphene, one being hydrophilic and the other hydrophobic. Here's, yes. my, qu here's, here's my question for you, Rajendra. Please. Um, what is happening to the graphene? You know, you refer to it as being degraded. But is are these enzymes are they breaking the carbon bonds and what is happening to the carbon atoms are they are they incorporating them ingesting them transferring it to another material are there byproducts what what's actually happening to the graphene itself and if if that's if that's a clear question yeah yeah that's a really I mean important question I I didn't explain because of the timeline. Uh, actually, the, these oxidative enzymes, whatever I showed that the radical species from the enzyme, uh, so they actually, they have a high relaxed potential. So they go on first uh, break the CO bond, I mean, for example, in a graphene oxide, and then it will also, buy, I mean, break the C bond adjacent to the CO bond. But in the case of graphene, so the degradation, uh, I mean, the pristine graphene, so the breaking of CC bond can also happen 
at the edges. So since graphene uh, materials are not really clean, so they have a lot of uh, structural defects or uh, kind of edges. So it can start the degradation of uh, our oxid breaking CC bond at the edges, and then uh, it'll, uh, it'll also move. And so the major major byproduct of these graphene materials is uh, carbon dioxide. Also, there are fragments. The fragments are nothing but some polyaromatic oxidized species. It could be you know, naphthalene or something like a uh, benzoic acid species. I mean, but there'll be like kind of polyaromatic uh, cycles with oxidized species. So that's, that could be the end product. Of, I mean, that's what we found out from the mass spectroscopy and uh, uh, from, uh, from other uh, uh, studies that we found out that we, there are various polycyclic, uh, you know, polyaromatic uh, compounds which are different oxide groups attached to the edges. So that could be the end product of these uh, graphene materials. And that, and, that, and that could be, sorry, and that could be more toxic than graphene sometimes. So that's the reason it's very important to, uh, you know, analyze the side oxidity of the byproducts also, not only graphene. Sorry. Well, yeah, no, that's an obviously a really important question. So, um, and as a layperson, I mean, would the interpretation be that graphene itself as a material is not toxic? We talked before about the immune response in the human body being driven more by the morphology, size, and shape of the material rather than the chemical composition. But, True. and I'm not sure if you can make a clear statement on this, but it, it, does that imply then that the graphene itself is not toxic, but the byproducts through the, um, through the, the body's immune response creates a toxic material? True. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, even the graphene, as you said, the graphene may not be that much toxic, but the byproducts, I mean, when they are injected, uh, since these neutrophils will be there in the, everywhere in the body, whenever we have implant, for example, someone has a medical, I mean, uh, implant in the heart or in the catheter, as a, uh, so slowly this, uh, when we have a, this implant uh, was uh, in, the, in the body, there will be, there will be these neutrophils uh, will be, uh, I mean, uh, aggregating or gathering at the site of the implant. And then slowly they'll produce the myeloperoxidase since they are immune cells. And that could do, that could lead to degrade these implants, graphene implants slowly. I mean, maybe in the well, in one year or in two years. And that degraded products can be more toxic than graphene alone. So I think this is a topic that requires a lot more study. Um, exactly. Because exactly. Sure. I, would assume, I would assume that if that's a byproduct uh, from that process, that that's happening all the time anyways in the body. Yes, yes. It's not just, uh, yeah, it's, it's not specific, to, yeah. it's not specific to graphene though, is it? Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. It's not the specific that uh, we, we cannot say only this kind of, uh, uh, I mean, we can only say some kind of structurally related compounds can be formed, but not really. Uh, for example, molybdenum disulfide, when it is got degraded, molybdenum disulfide, it forms a molybdenum ion. So that is clear. So there, is, there, there are no many, uh, you know, complex uh, structures. But when graphene is like polyaromatic species, when it got degraded, it can be degraded to you know large number of species, and that's really uh, uh, very uh, I mean challenging to really have a biocompatibility studies or such toxicity studies with that kind of a complex success. Excellent. Well, listen, thank you. I, I'm sorry that we're going to have to call it at that time. We're at the at the half hour mark. Rajendra, thank you for joining us from India. I appreciate your time and your Thank expertise you. on this aspect of using graphene and its relationship in medical and health applications. On behalf of the Graphene Council, I want to thank everybody for participating and for your interest in this sector. Clearly, graphene has a very important future in healthcare applications, whether it be for devices, medical sensing, diagnostics, or even in some of the infrastructure of gowns and, and devices and uh, elastomer products, et cetera, that can be enhanced with graphene. So with that, I wanna thank you very much. Thank you for your interest in the Graphene Council. If you have any questions, if you need any guidance, if you need information, anything to do with graphene or any of the companies that you saw in the past two days, please reach out to us and thank you for your time and attention.